Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. So, November in the Garden. Mm. What's been going on then, Chris? Oh, What's well, in the news? Well, I was going to say, it's all about autumn uh, fireworks, isn't it? Fireworks as, a, as in foliage and those wonderful tree colours we've been Yeah, the enjoying. yellows and reds of aces. And... Oh, yeah, it's, it's a glorious time of year. Get a nice bit of sunshine and everything looks wonderful. So, yeah, in the news, um, Peter, we've had quite a lot of st- uh, stories from the RHS, of course. Okay. One thing they're really sort of pushing is that they've launched a... Um, new sustainability strategy so they want we wanted to make all gardeners be a little bit more savvy when it comes to climate change which i think is wonderful initiative i mean they gave a little bit of research on the uh, i'm just reading this from garden news magazine and they're saying that if each of us that's uk's 30 million gardeners there's 30 million of us out there planted one medium-sized tree and nurtured it to maturity they would store the carbon equivalent of driving 11 million times around the planet. Wow. Yes. That's significant. So yeah. my plan for this year is to plant some, be attracting tulips around the edge of my lawn to mm-hmm. break up the bit between the fence and the lawn. Yep. So hopefully that'll be me doing my bit and maybe some alliums as well in there just so yep. I don't have to do as much lawn mowing, to be honest with you. But yeah, it, it is a good idea if we can plant a few things extra then mm-hmm. everything will benefit from it indeed and, and even obviously producing your own compost as well is going to help quite uh, quite substantially too so again you know again another call out for you know good time of the year we've got leaf mold potentially to be produced from all those uh, trees which are dropping nicely now uh, so yeah use that opportunity to make some leaf mold and again help to store some of that carbon which otherwise is going to be uh, ended up in the atmosphere and causing all sorts of problems to our our global climate um hmm. so this might be a silly question chris yeah. but um my neighbor's got a massive pine tree mm. that overshadows my my garden yeah. and obviously drops masses and masses of needles my plan is to scarify the lawn and all of that sort of what you call it mulch mm. the stuff that comes out in a scarifier is going to have a massive load of pine needles in it right. can i use that in my compost i i personally would would separate it and use it do you grow any ericaceous plants do you grow any camellias or uh pieris? i've got a rhododendron in, in, right. in the corner well yeah then use it as a as a mulch for your rhododendron yes um, okay a fairly generous mulch when we mulch we need to be putting down sort of two two or three inches around the around the base of the plant obviously keeping it away from the main stem because obviously we don't want to bury that so that would actually benefit quite a bit i would say in the scheme of things and uh, it will help to you know obviously uh, help your, your ph for your, for your rodent to, rhododendron to produce you know some nice strong growth too so yeah so are all coniferous trees going to give you a lime mm. uh, f- well, no, an acid compost they are indeed they're going to do that they're going to obviously change the ph structure of your soil so if you did add it to your your, your compost bin you would effectively get quite a quite an ericaceous, quite a, uh, an acidic uh, feel, which would be good if you were planting up or be, you're going to be doing some pots, you know, during the spring. Yep. That might be fine, but I would probably keep them separate and use it as a separate project. Okay, thank you. And in other news uh, on the RHS, uh, Sue Biggs, the, uh, the the Director General, is, is, is leaving after 11 years' tenure at, uh, at the RHS. So she's yep. done amazing things. And obviously, uh, last September was her, her final Chelsea Flower Show. Hmm. Well, I guess at least she got to see a September edition, which is a fairly rare one. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And it's interesting, you know, just going back slightly to Chelsea, um, obviously a lot of been sort of fairly mixed reactions now it's come and gone, but I think for a one-off show it was certainly enlightening. And uh, obviously we, we, we're quite pleased to report that our uh, our venue today, obviously uh, one of the Mulvern show buildings, they picked up a, a gold medal, I believe. Yeah, they, they, was it was the Green Room, which was a display sort of featuring lots of houseplants, wasn't mm. it? Yeah, the first time Chelsea has had so many houseplant displays, uh, which was, I think, very refreshing in view of how popular houseplants continue to be uh, out, out in the big wide world. Yeah. And the National Trust have announced 46 new blossom projects around the UK. Yes, this is really exciting. Um, I mean, we all, we all love our flowering cherry trees, don't we, Peter? Mm, they're just, yeah, yeah, they're definitely the in-plant. And uh, yeah, they're basically creating these, uh, these areas around uh, urban areas of the UK. And they're going to be expanding it, you know, year in, year out to okay. basically bring these wonderful trees to, to greater effect. Because obviously, en masse, 
uh, flowery cherries can look absolutely amazing. Yeah, because uh, I, I can remember visiting Japan many years ago, mm-hmm. and the parks out there, they have sort of, I don't know whether they're dedicated to cherry trees, or they just happen to mm. love cherry trees and they plant loads of them in the parks. But you see these, they're relatively small. So, you know, I was in Tokyo when I was viewing them, and maybe sort of 500 metre sort of square parks, but with a good walkway of cherries all the way through and when you see them in full bloom it is an incredible spectacle i guess the simple question to ask here chris is that are the flowering cherries they're different from your fruiting cherries aren't they or can you get one that is a great fruiter and flowerer i suppose you can i mean i, I grow i grow the variety cherry stella in my garden and that has lovely sort of fairly uh, large white flowers okay and on its own it actually looks very attractive so you it wouldn't look out of place in an ornamental garden and obviously the benefits of those wonderful uh, desert uh, des- yeah, dessert cherries uh, obviously a little bit later on in the year so yeah most people tend to go for the you know the varieties like kanzan which is your typical well it used to be a street tree didn't it where we used to have yep. a Street trees, obviously, they've sort of disappeared these days because of uh, new planning regulations and such like. Um, but yeah, uh, the um, the weeping cherries uh, particularly are, are attractive. And then, of course, if you've got very limited space in your garden, then the the flagpole cherry, you know, good old Prunus anamagawa, which is obviously always a popular favourite with our customers, especially because we sell those as a you know as a bare rooted tree in the in the early uh, early winter. Okay, and how big do they get? Yeah, I mean, I've seen Anamagawa's mature as probably about 20, 25 feet. And like you say, they're sort of a... So they're only about five, six, seven, eight foot wide, are they? They're, they're really... if, if it's that, actually, usually yeah. about about a yeah, metre, metre 20, I suppose. So they create this wonderful column. So if you've got a... If you're trying to block out a, an unsightly view, it's sometimes quite useful to, to plant a, a Prunus Anamagawa, you know, as a, as a good standby. And of course, even when it's not flowering in the in the in the summer, it has lots of really good foliage, yep. which will act as a good canopy. But yeah, a good doer. And I think we need to be planting more flowering cherries because they are they can or well, historically they can be quite short lived. Although anecdotally, we have customers here who've had them in thirty, forty years, and they've been growing well since been planted. So yeah, but it, it'd be nice to get more into our smaller gardens as they make good small garden trees. They do. Uh, I've planted a. Uh... Stella at mm. the bottom of the garden, yep. mm-hmm. and I've also got a. I think it was a sunburst in oh, yes. the allotment, mm-hmm. and Stella has done nothing. I planted them at the same oh, time. Interesting, and um, but the the one on the allotment that like, last year amazing crop of cherries mm. this year not so many okay. it, it, it does seem that they're a little bit more fickle than sort of mm. like the apple trees and things like that. But when you get a good crop and yeah. You just go down and pick, pick, pick. And generally, uh, the other thing I always find with my cherry trees is that they always seem to fruit when I'm on holiday. Of course. Or the, the fruit comes into full ripeness just when you're about to go on holiday and you're like, I'm going to be off for the next two weeks. The birds are going <laughs> to desiccate these and I'm not going to have a single cherry. But that's the joy of feeding nature, I suppose, isn't yes, it? It's, 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 as much as we might like to eat the cherries, it's good to feed the birds. Yeah, a bit of a double-edged sword, really. But I suppose at the end of the day, you know, a cherry tree generally are fairly self-fertile, so you don't really have to worry about uh, pollinators. However, it's always suggested if you are going to plant cherries that you do plant them in a in a block for, for better pollination. So because okay. of, yeah, so you can do that. So, yeah, Stella can be a bit tricky. I mind, mind every other year has a, a better year, so I think it's not too unusual for it to be a little bit unpredictable. So hopefully next year will be a good year. <laughs> Fingers crossed, yes. No late frost, hopefully, Peter. That's it. And National Stress Awareness Day is coming up soon as well, isn't it? Now, I've always found gardening quite... Uh, I guess it's quiet and you get to go off and play with the spade and dig a hole or you know, sort of <laughs> exercise. I mean, it's always... Whenever you go down a garden, you think, oh, I'll just do that. It'll only take five minutes. And an hour and a half later, you're still <laughs> hacking away at the bush or whatever it is that you're doing. But I, I always find gardening great for your mental well-being in a sense you're outside you get to enjoy the elements of the weather and whether it's windy or sunny or raining and it it does refresh you doesn't it yeah i think it does peter and i think uh, you know you can use your your garden almost as an outdoor gym really for the amount of sort of steps you do 
uh, that connection with nature. I mean, watching birds, watching the wildlife, um, yep. and, do, and doing some of the routine tasks we we sort of sort of enjoy during the summer. You think about sort of deadheading. Obviously, at this time of the year, we're we maybe doing a little bit of pruning back of our shrubs and such like. So yeah, so yeah, if you can immerse yourself in your garden and maybe immerse yourself in a good podcast, you're going to well, be halfway there. To be fair, that's one of the other benefits of being able to get out down in the garden and on the allotment mm. is that you get some time to yourself and i quite often have my headphones on and i like listening to various different podcasts and uh, yeah i know a friend of mine recommended a cycling podcast to me which i Mm -hmm. really do enjoy listening to and i I guess that's it isn't it if you've got something that you're enjoying tell your friends about it because hopefully they'll they like you what you like doing so th- there's a familiar sort of subject there so uh, yeah please do tell your friends if you do like our podcast indeed <laughs> yes hopefully yeah, they'll indeed. get to enjoy it as well yes yeah i mean i, I must admit when i'm in the garden um, the other day I, I, I try and tailor my listening of podcasts to obviously particular subject matter and uh, yeah yeah yesterday i was doing a little bit of pottering when i got home from work and i listened to my uh, my, my, my little fix of peter seabrook yep his week in the garden which obviously is very newsy very upbeat and uh, it's all—it's all about the extra things you learn. And if you are really connecting with nature on a, a seasonal basis, then that's certainly a great way of, uh, of really relating to what you do in the garden and to get the best out of your garden at that particular time. Brilliant. And it's National Tree Planting Week, I think, isn't it, coming up um, towards the end of November? That's right. It's the traditional time uh, for us to to, to celebrate tree planting it yep. started back in the 1970s i think it was 19 really yeah it's going back quite a long time. <laughs> an old one I mean, yeah i mean probably a little bit before then as well perhaps okay. but uh, certainly when it was a national campaign and it comes under the umbrella of all the all the the, the main garden nurseries and the, the industry tries to promote the idea of getting some more trees in obviously it works well with children and schools as well so there's usually yep. campaigns there and on the back of that of course we've got the uh, the, uh, the you know the canopy um the green the queen's green canopy scheme as well which is obviously... a, a scheme to get some free trees out there so if mm. is it just available to schools is it that... i think it is yeah so if if uh, if you're a head teacher or mm. in charge of the planting of your school then mm. this might be something you should have a look at and see how you can get some more free trees into your parkland yeah indeed so yeah basically head down to the uh, the woodland trust uh, their their website we'll put the link on the, the show notes and uh, yeah get get your uh, application in for some free trees for your for your school or your open community spaces yeah because to this day i can still remember eating beech nuts at school because um <laughs> mm-hmm. i was very fortunate that, that our school had i mean well i saw a beech tree that was a hundred years old a couple of weeks ago i was like Wow, that's quite small compared to... I know when you're a child, everything always seems bigger, Mm -hmm. but I'm fairly convinced that the beech trees that we used to get these beech nuts from were at least twice the size. So I'm guessing beech trees are going to live, what, three, four hundred years? I think they're pretty long-lived trees, aren't they? Yes, Um, and the beech forests. Have you ever tried eating a beech nut? I have never tried. Should I, I, Peter? Seriously, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I, I mean, it might be just a a golden sort of memory (laughs) from your childhood that isn't actually quite as nice. But I I do seem to remember, you used to peel the Mm. sort of outside off and there was this sort of woolly nut inside. Mm -hmm. And very, some of them weren't great, but the ones that were nice were really nice. A bit like pine nuts in their sort of texture but totally different flavor but i'll start chasing those squirrels then when i go through the definitely uh, well worth it and i was pleased to see um we've got a new raspberry coming in well this time of the year now isn't it it's it's mail order bear root season Mm. isn't it we've got a new heritage raspberry coming in that's right yes and it's always exciting um i mean raspberries are obviously uh, well they are the top of the 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 soft fruits Uh, certainly when i did a a straw poll with our our our, um, customers a couple of years ago um certainly the flavor of raspberries in many ways outshines strawberries uh, for a lot of people really Uh, yes yeah well i mean to be fair when you're down the allotment picking raspberries yeah I do admit to eating quite a few of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, stra- strawberries are always popular because I suppose they're that little bit easier to grow. However, 
get some nicely established raspberry canes and you're usually well away. Um, and as we know with raspberries, it's, it's the establishment can be a bit tricky. But this new variety, Heritage, is new to, to us, so we've, we've never sold it. Um, it's what they describe as an ever-bearing variety. So that means it produces effectively two crops. It produces a, 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 a smallish crop during the summer and then... As if by magic, it carries on flowering and then produces an even heavier crop in the autumn. Okay, that's good then. Yeah, so it means if you buy if you buy some this autumn, you get them in and established, you will get a good crop by the end of sort of October, early November next year. Um, which, of course, with summer fruiting varieties, you have to wait a year because you have to basically put in the uh, the growth and the structure to give you those fruiting canes, which, of course sit there in a nice green state and then don't produce a crop until the following year. So if you're looking to get a really quick crop of raspberries, then Heritage really does tick all the proverbial boxes. Yeah, because the other variety of um, raspberry that I tasted Mm. recently, um, I suggested them, uh, not as a joke, but Mm. just as something different, the golden um, raspberries Mm. that we sell. And uh, Dan, my friend, uh, had a couple of canes and he's grown them and Ooh. tasted them and they're really nice. Yeah, very they're nice. Very nice flavour and totally sort of odd when you see a. Is that a raspberry? Is that, yeah, it was it golden. That, that can't be a raspberry. But no, <laughs> they, 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 they taste does... like a really nice raspberry, but just an odd colour. So yeah, yeah. I should imagine all of the sort of fancy chefs will be using them mm. for their puddings in, in yeah. the near future. Indeed. I, I think I had the same instance uh, a few years ago when we sold pine berries, which is a, fo- a, a form of strawberry, but right. they're bright white. Okay, and that really sort of mucks up with your your brain because you 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 bite into it and it is a strawberry flavour, albeit a little bit different, a little, probably a little bit sharper. However, the fruit is is effectively white. Ah, so that's interesting. Yeah, yes. And are they they're not an alpine strawberry. No, they're a, a full size strawberry. You know what you'd you know, sort of size you'd find in in in, the, in your uh, supermarket. Uh, so like your Cambridge favourites. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I have a look out for them. Um, you, I don't, you don't see them that off, that much offered these days in in the uh, the retail world. For, probably yeah. for the reason I think they're not as they're a bit shy in producing the amount of flour. So perhaps right. they, but they are they are a, a, obviously a U, USA version of our strawberry. Um, and okay. yeah, it, it sort of sits there and and does its little thing. But yeah, heritage. Uh, I think in all sense of the word, I think raspberries. Uh, yeah, you can't really go wrong with a, a good 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 crop of raspberries. Brilliant. So jobs in the garden. What should we be thinking about doing at the moment? I mean, the leaves are still oh, yes. blowing around my garden. Um, <laughs> I really should get the rake out and rake some of them up and chuck them on the compost heap. What would, do you think we should be doing, Chris? Yes, I mean, this time of year, you know, giving your, your, your garden a bit of a tidy. Certainly those leaves do cause a bit of a mess. And obviously any bit of last-minute pruning as well you might want to be, be doing. Um, certainly my... Um, uh, roses, my bush roses will get a trim back in the next uh, few days by okay. half because obviously I don't want the dreaded wind rock to spoil the the plants for uh, for next year. Yep. Um, and then obviously go around and uh, probably do a bit of assessing some of your successes and failures. It's always a good time this time of year just, just to have a look back at you know as you walk around what perhaps needs to be moved, yep. what needs to be transplanted. Maybe make a note of some you know herbaceous plants you might want to split and divide. It's a good time of the year to do that. And if you want to move any structural you know um, parts of the plants you know plants as well if you want to do a bit of a, a makeover in a new board you might want to add some new roses or whatever now is a good time to earmark that maybe have a look through the the catalogues to decide what you're going to be growing there as well okay. so uh, yeah a bit of a uh, a review of the year year really uh, at a time where we are effectively going into our new season and it's always very exciting i mean november is effectively the the start of the garden year a little bit like october in as much that you can do lots of plants planting uh, and in, in your own time you're not sort of pressurized by the weather and the heat and uh, potential droughts and uh, host pipe bands you've got a nice time to actually do it in a very relaxed way I say, so long as it's not freezing or of snowing course. or <laughs> dipping down with rain yeah. or playing a hoolie. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And just thinking a bit more sort of about preparation mm. for next year I and mean, obviously Mail order season is just about to Indeed. hit us now. Mm. Um, uh, speaking to a friend of mine about he wants to plant a mixed native hedge, and 
suggest uh, saying we'll get the ground prepared mm. in advance so that when the plants do arrive, you can pop them straight in. And he, he suggested he asked the question: Could um, he he use a rotavator to dig his trench? Because my mother's always been a sort of get the spade out and put your back into it and get some exercise. <laughs> um, although the rotavators are just oh, as yes, hard they... to fight as so they bounce around, aren't they? Huh? <laughs> yeah. I would say, Peter, most definitely. I mean, a rotavator will certainly um, obviously manipulate your soil, will bring a lot of the debris up. It'll obviously bury a lot of uh, potential weeds and things. But the most important thing is you get rid of all that um, potential competition around the roots where your, your new hedging plants are going to be going. Yeah, because he's planting it in... Well, he wants to plant the, uh, into what is currently turf. Okay. So, like you say, sort of, mm. it's very important to clear an area. Most definitely. Sort of, what, what are we looking at? Six, it's sort of 12 inches? Yes, I mean, a good a good spade's depth will give you an awful lot of uh, leverage as far as the roots. I mean, try and avoid going to... If you go sort of two spades, you are going to be into the drainage subsoil, which, yeah, have got 5 or 10% goodness in there. But obviously, in a very claggy soil, that might not be a good thing. Sometimes, in a clay soil, it is a good thing because then, of course, you can then work some grit or other material to help to the drainage around your plant so yeah try and um, yeah assess your soil obviously those, those very wet soils you really want to be trying to put some extra drainage in but yep. yeah the preparation is it's all about preparation do the preparation and actually the planting is a lot of fun yeah because if you've got a nicely prepared trench all ready mm. to go you just literally get your fork or your bait yep quick lift of it and then off you go so like you say sort of a good good preparation is always a key to good planting yeah and i would say most definitely especially if you're going to be planting say a mixed native hedge where you've got to when you, you, you your plants arrive you've got to sort of split them up into the different species and you have to then divide them across the the, the length of hedge that can take a little bit of time and of course you've, you've got the pressure of doing that and then obviously the, the the whole process of trying to get them in the right order uh, yep. that makes it a lot easier so uh, yeah make make planting pleasurable and you know have a little bit of a planting party get the, the whole family involved and uh, it, it, the time flies and of course you know at this time of the year when the wind's blowing it's a little bit cold and the nights are definitely drawing in now you want to get yeah. it done sort of by mid-afternoon good idea and pots and baskets what do we need to be thinking about with our pots and baskets indeed yeah i mean a lot of people have been hold, holding on to their displays and you know the autumn's been reasonably kind to us hasn't it so but you have to come to that point where you have to say right that's me my futures and dreams done for the year obviously they need to be moved in if you're going to overwinter them uh, into a nice frost free you know light cool conditions the your futures and ger, ger, your geraniums your pelagonias are going to be fine there and then it needs to make space then for your your, your bulbs to go in there you know you yeah. your pots so i'd love to put my my tulips in in november i'll do it even into december if if push comes to shove to okay. be honest with you because I, I just think it just to put them in a little bit later is good because then i get the maximum out of my my displays and then obviously you can use then your, your winter flowering pansies and your violas and then obviously all that wonderful lovely foliage and flowering plants we've got at the garden center at the moment things like your skimmias and your your wonderful ornamental grasses they're looking amazing at the moment too yeah, because uh, the skimmias have got some nice color in mm. this time of year haven't they and that, it's always you know winter is coming when the skimmias come into the garden center yeah. You're absolutely right, Peter. I always, yes, it's a bit of a nod to, to winter, but yeah, Skimia rubella is the one most of us tend to grow. Um, yep. Remember, it is slightly on the ericaceous side, so you do need to make sure your compost has, is basically uh, lime free. Okay. Um, but your bulbs will grow perfectly well in there if you're going to put a few bulbs in there for, for a, a, a fairly instant display. And uh, they'll give you colour. But obviously, your ornamental grasses, your hookeras, your hookerellas. Uh, maybe your cyclamen, your your winter cherries, little selenums, they can all go in there and they'll give you some nice colour right up to Christmas now uh, and maybe beyond if, if the weather's is mild. And then, of course, those bulls then push through and give you that nice bit of colour come uh, February, March and April. Yes, I suppose on, on the bulb side as well, um, PT, it's probably the last opportunity. You might want to do a, a lasagna planting of your bulbs, like we were yep. discussing before with uh, with our, our guests from Taylor's Bulbs uh, a couple of uh, podcasts ago. And I think, yes, if you can get hold of some, uh, obviously some tulips and maybe some narcissi, maybe a few, few crocus, you could create that display really well. 
but you've really got to get on with it. And yeah, yeah. Try, but, get up to garden centre quickly, quick, because yeah. there might not be many bulbs left now. Indeed, and you often find at the tail end of the season, sometimes bulbs are sometimes discounted anyway, so you yes. might grab yourself a nice bargain too. And if, if that's the case, then you have to plant away, you know, get as many of your pots done there as well. And if you want to obviously naturalise your bulbs in your garden, um, yes, obviously your, your usual suspects, your snowdrops and your crocus might uh, f- fit the bill or some some nice short narcissi too. But again, you need to be doing that sooner rather than later. Okay, thank you. So earlier we were talking about the new raspberry heritage variety we've got. Chris, mm. I'm going to admit another fact of my terrible gardening here. Um, I planted some raspberries, I'm going to say about eight, nine years ago. Okay. They've grown well, as raspberries tend to. <laughs> okay. And... I haven't pruned them yet. I, I was sensing a butt here. So. <laughs> now, right. I think I'm meant to prune them, is it every year? Right. Do we know the variety, Peter? Do we know when they crop? Let's find out when they crop. So they, they... You know, they fruit in the summer. Right. They're not so, a late, late right. fruiter, so they're, okay. they're summer fruiting ones. Right. That's good. Um, I haven't got a clue what they are. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> I can't no. remember. No, it, is, it was eight or nine years ago I planted it's fine, it's them. Fine. But... So, so the rule is, and it's quite a straightforward rule with summer, flower, uh, summer cropping and summer flowering raspberries, is you, you cut out, you cut back the canes which have given you a crop. So, okay. So as soon as they've you've you've basically picked the last raspberry on that cane, follow the stem back and go to the soil level and cut that cane out. And if you go through methodically and remove all your um, spent canes, as we would probably call them, those which yep, have flowered, the old ones, the old ones, what you'll be left with then will be a whole new bunch of new ones produced probably that spring. Yeah. And those are the ones to put in place for your fruit next year, so you don't. Please don't prune those shoots back because they will be. The, I won't yeah, yeah. Get a crop next That's year. It. But so, um, as the raspberries have, I mean, they've grown really well. They, no, I put them in as a single <laughs> row of canes, and right. they're now about six, eight foot across. Okay, and <laughs> yeah. I can't honestly. It's good. they've mm. got to such a point where they're a bit unmanageable. Right. If I cut them all down i know mm-hmm. it's not the best thing because obviously i'm not going to get a crop next year mm-hmm. if i level the whole lot um and dig some trenches down the middle so i've got some pathways to be able to access them next year yeah yeah it's not going to kill them it's, it? it's just going to st- put them back a year so. it is and at least you'll be able to get you'll be able to, to get rid of some of the old root systems and maybe reinvigorate the, the the whole uh, area by by doing that so okay so yeah. I'm, I'm I'm not such a terrible gardener not, after not, all not at all no <laughs> um, I mean they always say uh, raspberries yeah how long does a raspberry cane last I mean five years eight years yes I mean any time in between that sort of date normally but it does, does depend on your soil depends how they've been looked after they've been well, lots they've, of, they've grown they've well grown, by, yeah, yeah, by under the their own things. steam yeah they, yeah they haven't had much yeah, care or attention they yeah. get um, the raspberries picked off mm. them but like I say so they've got just so wide now that I can't get into the middle I think you and, yeah I think you need to be managing them get, get them into a, a more defined area and then if you're in a more defined area then yeah give them a nice generous mulch after you've done that okay. uh, and maybe give them some extra feed next spring to put on those shoots and then maybe I don't know, maybe cage. Well, I use the word cage. Maybe put some stakes in and, and uh, put some Ys in to give them a, a proper compartment to grow in, a channel, which will make it easier for you to to maybe uh, manage the, the long canes which are produced. That okay. might, might, might make things a little bit easier, perhaps. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, they, 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 they grow very vigorously mm. and well yeah. and <laughs> expand well, so they, maybe you know, <laughs> yeah. hemming them in a bit yeah. might actually make it a bit easier yeah. to look after them. That's a good idea. Thanks, Chris. No problems. And anything else we need to be thinking about pruning-wise? Yes, so we mentioned a little bit about roses earlier, about windrock. Then there is another plant, well, there's a couple of other plants, really, which probably would benefit from that, and that's uh, obviously your, your lavatera. Yep. Um, lovely plants. I mean, uh, Lavatera is such a, a popular summer flowering plant. Um, but again, they can get quite tall. I mean, mine's touching probably eight foot at the moment. Right. And, and yes, a bit of autumn gales can knock it over. So half it by whatever height it is to around about four foot if it's that sort of height. Yep. And then in February, when you're pruning your roses, then I go in with the, the secateurs and prune it back to probably, probably knee high or maybe a little bit shorter if it's got plenty of shoots in the bottom there. Okay, so so cut it in half now, yeah. and then think about in the spring, cut it in half probably again. That's it. So yes, you're yeah. really you know, trimming yeah. them down. Yeah. And, 
and I was going to say, you, you're doing that to, to obviously stimulate more growth and you want as much new growth from the bottom. Otherwise, you'll get growth appearing halfway up the plant, which won't be as productive. You won't get the flowering potential like you can from uh, from lower lower down shoots, which have more vigour. Okay. And hazelnut trees, do we need to think yes. about pruning them? Because I, I love hazels. So mm. They're such, you know, Cosford and uh, I've got a few in the allotment. Mm. Um, they're, they're, they're nice plants, but they do over the years yes. do get quite big again don't they when do we prune when's best to prune a hazel i mean technically you, you would do that in the spring but if you've got a very overgrown plant which has again has produced wonderful cropping wood so if you've yep. got shoots which i've got it might be worth taking a few of those back and that'll help to stimulate some nice strong shoots from the base again which of course you want for productivity especially with hazels because effectively you are coppicing these plants back you're cutting them back to reinvigorate them so uh, yeah go through and, and do a little bit of trimming uh, with those um the other plant i was thinking of ornamentally is hibiscus the the hardy okay. hibiscus yeah um mine always comes into flower usually at the end of august you know when you think it's never going to flower it then it does its show and looks great for probably about a month six weeks so it doesn't last a long time but again it gets quite tall and those straggly stems can get damaged by uh, by the wind. So give them a little bit of a tidy prune as well. And anything you prune, obviously, um, we normally say give it a give it a feed. Well, not the right time of the year for most things, but a good mulch wouldn't go amiss at this time of year. So a nice bit of garden compost uh, or a bit of well-rotted farmyard manure around a lot of these plants you, you're cutting back just to help to stimulate some good, strong growth uh, next year. And then they'll hopefully kick off well mm. in the spring and give no. a, give another year's growth. And that's it. You'll need to cut them back yet again. Again, yeah, yeah. It's quality growth, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. it. And the other thing that always amazes me when you buy a say like a bare root quickthorn at three to four foot, mm. you're buying what you think is go around the garden centre. You see all these lovely big sort of hedging plants. Mm. And then you get them home, and the first thing that they say in the instruction is cut them in half, yes. or cut them right down. And you think, well, I've just paid <laughs> so, no, one pound fifty for this nice little plant, and um, now you're asking me to cut it in half. Yeah, the same idea there, is it, Chris? To reduce the stress on the uh, roots, presumably, so they get going well. I think so. You, you're trying to do two things, really. If you put, especially putting a new hedge of, say, yeah, quickthorn or blackthorn or maybe some beech. Um, the rule generally is to cut them back by, well, with, with quick thorn, any native species, you can cut them back by half if you wish, but I usually say a, a good third. Okay. So take it So I, I'm being too savage, am I? A, a, bit, a bit too cruel. <laughs> but then, you know, it, but the thing is, the more you prune, obviously, the more emphasis you put on the root system. The root system will respond quite quite quickly. The poor plant thinks, you know, you're cutting it back. It goes into a slight, slight stress mode. It puts some more strong growth come the uh, the late winter, early spring, on to producing some nice, shoot, strong root systems. Yeah. And then the plant goes into overdrive by producing lots of lateral growth from where you've cut back to. Yeah, because so that's the secret to getting mm, a good bushy hedge. It, it is. You, you don't want something that grows sort of two foot up with nothing on the base if you yeah. plant a new hedge. And that's the other thing that, again, everyone wants instant hedges. Mm, they do. They do indeed. Yeah. the best ones always come from the smallest seedlings. So uh, you're, you're actually better off getting the 12 to 18 inch sort of size plants and then cut them back. Mm -hmm. So you've only got maybe a 10 inch plant at the end of it that's going to then sprout out all the way from the bottom and give you a really thick bushy hedge yeah. as it grows it will do and you'll be you'll be very surprised how quickly they do put on growth i remember what you're trying to do in that first year with any plant you put in, especially a bare rooted plant is to get a really good strong root system in yep. place and active and that means the plant will then get away certainly in the second spring it'll put on lots and lots of growth and all that extra heartache of cutting it back and getting the secateurs out will be worth it and you'll get a really nice framework and of course with a hedging plant it's all about that uh, framework you produce in that first two years so it's critical that you you do uh, you know, seize the day get the get the secateurs out and, and go in gung-ho and cut back um, I was suggest to our customers that they plant the hedge line and then they grab themselves a little little garden cane as a measuring stick yep. uh, so if, if, if you're putting say two to three foot 60 to 90 uh, centimeter plants in cut it to 60 centimeters tall this cane and use that as your measuring stick and go along and cut them all the same height that's a good idea so you get a nice uniform 
yeah. hedge to start off with all yeah. at the same height and equally like you say so it cuts it all back and, um, and it, it takes the guesswork out of where to cut as well Peter you just know exactly where to cut and whether you cut just above a bud really it's not that critical when it comes to bare rooted native species as long as the cut's nice and clean so make sure good shop secateurs that's that's the most important thing and the plant will then re-sprout and then uh, obviously once you've got your your bare rooted plants in yeah put a nice generous mulch down if the the compost you've been adding to your your planting trench or your um your where, where you've got the rotivator out is dry do give them a little bit of a water in. Okay. Your neighbours will think you're absolutely balmy getting the host pipe out in November and December, but actually just give them just to give them a give little them bit moist, of water yeah. will make a lot of difference. To well, we say like plant. when we're healing the plants in, mm. if you can't plant, if you haven't managed to get your trench dug or your ro- trench rotivated in yeah. advance and you're healing the plants in, it's always best to give them a quick soak. Yeah. Because obviously when they've been packed and sent out through the couriers, it's a good sort of three four days i would suggest that it's going to take from the time they're pulled out of the field packed up sent out even when the couriers only take 24 hours 48 hours Indeed. these days to get the plants to you they start drying out mm. and if you're buying them from a reputable sort of retailer obviously they'll make sure that the roots are kept moist with their packing and mm. um, Indeed. but obviously best try and give them their best start ever and i guess that's where the difference between us home gardeners and the landscape gardener who goes along with the spade and does slip planting i mean Ooh, that, that, yes. that's probably your antithesis of uh, oh what... no 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 yes it's it's, it's what is done out there and, and split planting is, is is very it's time saving but actually... yeah you can plant a hundred meters of hedge yeah. in a day whereas yeah. if you do it properly it's gonna you'd be lucky to get 20 meters done unless Indeed. you've obviously got a nice powerful rotivator mm. dig the trench out yeah. and do it sort of with the help of mechanics so, yeah i know it's slip planting they do when the landscapers do slip planting, they always expect to lose sort of 20 to 30% of the hedge, yeah. which is what they build into the cost. And okay, Did the hedge, the plants are very cheap. So in some respects, you think, well, fair enough. But equally, if you want to get a nice hedge and it all to be uniform and the same height, mm-hmm. it's always better to do it properly. Yeah. And, give the plants the best possible start ever. Yeah, and I think, Peter, at the end of the day, you, you, your plant is a living thing and you want to give it the best possible chance uh, from the start. So from when you unpack your plants, when they arrive bare-rooted, yeah, yeah, 15, 20 minutes in a, a bucket of water just to rehydrate them, then you're ready then to either do your planting if you've got your soil prepped or then you dig a little trench out and put them in a temporary healing in sort of situation for however long time you take. I think, I think we planting hedges from my experience doing it over the years is make it as enjoyable as possible you, you're planting at a time of the year which is sometimes cold it's going to be windy. cold yeah windy. so do it in the best possible way again get yourself nicely wrapped up you know get, get make sure you've got a, a nice nice uh, hot brew to start your day off well, i think that's it there's a good suggestion there chris and these lovely thermos flasks that keep mm. you drive to work these days and uh, have a cup Absolutely. of tea on the way and yeah. uh, take one of those out with yeah. you when you're gardening in the winter because yeah. it, it's always nice to have a quick sip of a hot drink most definitely and if you're doing a long stretch of hedge and you're on a bit of a mission yeah yeah plug yourself into your podcast as well good idea is there anything we should be thinking about sowing at the moment chris yes please i think um yeah broad beans are probably the 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 most uh, popular veg at this time of year which you can sow successfully uh undercover if you've got a cold frame or you can sow direct if your soil's fairly uh, friable and and free draining okay. um, they don't get hit by the frost then no because you, you'll be sowing a variety such as the sutton which yep. is um is a variety it's uh, mr fothergill's variety at the garden center here i mean you I know a, a variety of seed merchants sell the sutton good variety quite short growing um quite robust uh, very productive but if you've got some cloches, you can give it a little bit of extra protection through the winter so much for that. You could obviously start them up in a cold frame if you wanted and grow them in uh, root trainers or in um, in, in individual pots. Yep. Bear in mind, our friendly little furry mice tend to like uh, broad beans. So yep. be, be prepared if you've got to obviously keep those uh, little uh, little rodents at bay. But if you can get them planted and established before the end of November this month uh, or early December, it just means you're going to be about a month, six weeks ahead head of those broad beans you might sell it so in february and early march so you'll okay. you, you will get an earlier crop yep. and uh, it's probably worth the you know the the opportunity and and uh, the slight risk you take with that brilliant and uh, i see there's also sweet peas mm. we, we can think about planting and yes 
Yeah, I think sweet peas are, are good. Um, again, again, you're going to get a head start, and if, especially if you want to enjoy longer displays of sweet peas in the garden. Um, if you get a sowing in this month and overwinter them in a cold frame in a greenhouse, uh, yeah, don't plant those out just yet. Just get them growing as as little seedlings. Yep. Um, and then keep them in almost like suspended animation through the winter, and again, then pl- get them planted out, planted out in February, or early March. You're going to be then a good month, six weeks ahead, and. Again, if you do some spring sowings, that'll extend your season probably by about another six, eight, maybe ten weeks. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, sweet peas for me is all about the aroma, oh, uh, the amazing. scent of a sweet pea. It's beautiful, isn't it? It, it really is. is. Yeah, it's, it's it's to me, it is summer in, encapsulated in one flower, really, and uh, and they are worth the effort. And more and more people are growing sweet peas. We know that from the sales of our our seeds here and from the young plants we sell in the spring. Because that's it, isn't it? I mean, you think. So sort of dare I say it when I started here 20 30 years ago sweet peas used to have whole stands mm. in the seed yes. racks yes. of sweet peas whereas yes. now you don't see, they're not separated away they're just in they're in in the main display mm. so I guess people are buying a lot more plants these days than they are the, and the instant sort of let's go out but the, the cheap way to do it is still with seeds and mm-hmm. you can like you say it's a nice experience I always think when you growing seeds what's going to pop up are Indeed. we going to get them to grow and are they going to come up yeah. and, and, the, and the thing with sweet peas is they are very predictable you know that once you've got them germinated they do sort of grow well they don't they don't tend to get much in the way of pests and diseases you know they're they're, they're not particularly fickle as plants go and you're saying about the uh, the seed merchants i do remember in um, when i first got into gardening um, people like unwin seeds which are sadly yep. no longer with us they were innovators at the time of seed, uh, sweet pea breeding. And yep. they had wonderful trials over in Cambridgeshire. Um, I was showing all their different varieties. And I was, I did go a couple of times um, in my previous role in, in magazine work to, to report on these new varieties they were, were producing. Okay. And we've, we've lost that sort of infidence. I mean, I know there's some really good sweet pea enthusiasts out there. And we are still seeing some good varieties, but not to what we had, you know, probably 20 or 30 years ago, which is a little bit sad. It is, isn't it? Especially when they are such a glorious smelling flower. But most definitely, yes. And it's generally around this sort of time of year that we do the last cut on the lawn until the spring, isn't it? Now, I know mm. I've been told you raise the height of the cutting up. Mm. So this time of year, it's now inch and a half, two inches length of lawn that you're looking for. Because if you cut it too tight and low to the ground, it's a lot harder for the grass, obviously, to get through the winter. So... Mm, most definitely you don't want to be sort of scalping your lawn really at this time of year because of course you you're trying to build up the lawn really in preparation for the winter so yeah you're just taking the tips out which of course is what you do so yeah if you've got a if you've got a a hover type mower there's an easy adjustment on those if you've got something a bit more traditional a cylinder mower then obviously it's just usually a couple of uh, adjustments there and uh, make sure it's then set in place because obviously you'll still to you you'll need that that setting at the beginning of the season as well when we start cutting our lawn yeah it's very true yes and equally i always try if i'm going to service my mower Mm. So generally December, if you take it down to the, the local sort of repair shop, they'll yep. be far happier to deal with it in the winter than they Most are definitely. come the spring when you they get inundated with lawnmowers that aren't starting and need fixing. Mm. And I suppose as well, Peter, yeah, if you need to get your, your blade sharpened on your cylinder mower as well, that's a good opportunity yeah. to, good to time get those to do it as well. Because yeah. They've got yeah. a couple of months before you need to use it again. Indeed, yes. And then obviously on the feeding side of things, um, obviously autumn lawn food, uh, yep. comes into play here and if you are doing your, your sort of last cut then if you can leave it a week or so after your cut before you apply your um, your lawn uh, autumn lawn feed and remember your autumn lawn feed is low on nitrogen it's not got much nitrogen at all because obviously you don't want to encourage all that leafy growth it's all about keeping those roots happy and building the roots uh, stronger for the for the, the winter spring. period uh, yeah and obviously, frosts are well and truly around us at the moment, aren't they now? So yes. um, covering your plants up, that's mm. always an important one. 
It is, yeah. And I mean, these days we use lots of horticultural fleece in the garden. I certainly have got a good store in my in my shed. Um, yep. And I use it in my greenhouse as much as I use it to, to cover my plants outdoors. Okay, really? um, and I, I do, I just lay it over my seedlings and my, my tender plants or my subtropical plants, which I've brought in and I'm trying to keep it at a cooler temperature just to lift the, the temperature around the plants by a, a couple of degrees. And it seems to work. And of course, they're, uh, they're, they're uh, transparent, so they're let light in they don't cause any problems light levels are low in, in this time of year as well yep. so if you've got a greenhouse certainly one job i've been tattling is to give your your greenhouse glass a little bit of a clean to get yep. a let in all the possible light and combine that with your, your fleecing of your plants you'll make sure that you give the plants the best possible chance through the winter good point and if you've got a garden pond obviously with the ice potentially coming uh, now for the winter mm-hmm. the trick i always used to have was uh, in my pond was a football Mm-hmm. On on milder evenings where there's not going to be a really heavy frost uh, and a little bit of wind, the ball just blows around a little bit and keeps the whole surface free. But obviously, if it, you do get a really cold patch um, where you're getting half an inch, an inch maybe of ice, all you've got to do once the ball's frozen to the top of the uh, top of the pond um, is I used to take a kettle of water out pour it over the football and obviously that runs down the side yeah clever Mm. releases the football from the ice pop it out and you've got an inch or two uh, free of um, water underneath where the the, the ball was and Mm. off you go you've got your ice hole it's a lot easier than trying to melt saucepans through the ice and all those uh, other lovely tricks I was going to say, Peter, is it another use for your thermos flask as well? If you're taking some hot water down to the garden, yeah, you could use yeah, that yeah. as well there. Would you use that same principle on, on a sort of nature wildlife ponds? Which, which It doesn't fish? hurt mm-hmm. because obviously there's always some um, things rotting in the bottoms of ponds, which mm-hmm. um, if they're anaerobic are releasing lots of um, sulfurous compounds and things like of that, course. which mm-hmm. aren't particularly great um, mm-hmm. for the wildlife in the pond. So yeah, certainly I, I would say if you've got the time to look after your pond um, and get out there and clear a little bit of uh, the surface, then yeah, it's always going to help and all the wildlife in the pond will benefit from being able to sort of get oxygen into the water again. Yeah, and I'm thinking about my wildlife pond about, uh, obviously I've got quite a lot of marginal plants around the edge. Yep. Is it, would you sort of be started to think about sort of dividing those or lifting those or am I best waiting till spring on, on those plants? Well, obviously not if they're covered in ice because no, no, <laughs> you're going to do some damage um, pulling <laughs> yeah. them out of the ice and mm. uh, you might not have many plants to divide up. Uh, yeah. up. But yeah, certainly, I mean, the winter time a lot of the plants have sort of died right back so mm-hmm. yeah it's a, it is a good time to think about repotting your marginal plants and lilies again the leaves have all disappeared now so indeed. again you can pull them up and yeah. potentially split them divide them and either put some on the compost heap or put some into pot and give it to your neighbor who's also got a pond because lilies are good mm. grows i mean certainly things like Nymphia alba, which is the white mm, one. one. I mean, it's such a vigorous grower. So, in a lot of ponds, that it just outgrows them. So, yeah, definitely worth thinking about doing that. And also, Nufa latiums are an, again another nice native plant, but mm. do tend to get very big. So, yeah, if you've got the time and uh, the energy and don't mind the cold water, it is a good time of year to think about repotting them. That's great. Perfect. Thanks, Peter. Because the other thing that obviously needs water this time of the year is the wildlife, of course, the and yes. things like the hedgehogs. And yep. if you've got a bird bath, um, obviously, yeah, try and put some warm water in that. And uh, if there has been a big frost and it's all frozen solid, because uh, obviously the birds still need to drink and feeding the birds as well. Yes, a, I suppose. Uh, yes, it's that time of the year when peanuts we start... always seem to go well in my garden. They do, and, yeah. You know, the, I love seeing the birds. Now, I know there's in the news recently, there's been a few articles about sort of whether we should feed the birds mm. all year round or whether the best time of year to feed them is spring. I mean, what are your thoughts? Do you feed all year round, Chris? Or are I, you, I, uh... I do take a break, I have to say. I take a okay. break from usually uh, probably up to sort of beginning, beginning to the end of May. I sort of slow down. Yep. Uh, because I think there's enough. I want them to go and 
basically feed on my aphids. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Why not? Because there's plenty of those around. And I think also, you know, you've got all the, the wonderful pollinating insects around as well. So there should be lots of free flying food for them as well. And then I reinstate usually, yeah, middle to the end of September. So I take a bit of a break. But I suppose if your birds are used to you feeding every week all the year round yeah yeah then i think there's a therefore a commitment on yourself to to carry on doing that but i think it doesn't it doesn't harm to break your cycle if you feel your garden's going to benefit and perhaps the birds are going to benefit because they're going to have to then seek out uh, food and also you've got lots of fledglings during that part of the, the year as well which yep. uh, yeah but i mean a good a good mix of food whether it's seed whether it's peanuts whether it's uh, sunflower uh, seeds i mean just make sure there's plenty of variety on the bird table i think that's quite important especially at this time of the year I think it's also, I mean, talking about well-being earlier, mm. I, personally, I, I, I put a Niger seed feeder out, mm. and I'm very fortunate that we've got goldfinches in mm. Northampton. I mean, it's a not a rural area where you traditionally think, but for some reason they obviously do like it in my area in Northampton, and I love seeing them. You get a good flock of goldfinches come in, and That's, so yeah. beautiful sort of yellow... Mm. Birds that fly in, they're, they're, they're so beautiful. It's interesting because last year and this year I planted teasels to encourage okay. bird finches. I haven't seen one. <laughs> so, you know, and then these, I mean, teasels grow big. Uh, they're not I've, small, are they? No, they're I lovely mean, plants, aren't yes, they? Yes, and, I've, yeah. and I've, I've got loads of seedlings coming up, which is nice because um, it's in the wildlife area. But these these plants get up to, you know, eight to ten foot tall. Yep. And they were, you know, they had loads of seeds on them. I thought, yes, this is going to be the time goldfinches finally arrive to my garden. No, no, and that's two years on the trot. So I will, I will try. Excellent. You keep Thank at you. it, but oh, bear well. in mind, your neighbour's feeding them prepared <laughs> seed, ready to go. They don't have to do any work. Off are they going to go? <laughs> that's that's the thing, isn't it? But I think on the whole area of, of wild, you know, attracting wild uh, life and the planting. So yes, there's a few things we can obviously do. I mean, it's getting a little bit late to obviously sow seeds, but maybe a bit of planning if you are planning to create a wildlife area next spring then maybe you might want to introduce some sort of native species of, of plants to the, the borders so you might want to put some nice uh, you know rosa rugosa hedging you know bare rooted hedging in yep. or maybe you want to put some hazel you know put some nice hazel in there or spindle or yeah some nice uh, slows and uh, and quick thorn just to add to the variety because at the end of the day a, a native wildlife area should have you know a bit of tree structure in there a bit of shrubby sh- structure uh, a bit of snow berry in there to give you a bit of under uh, low canopy planting as well so you can create a re- really nice mixture quite inexpensively by yep. by doing that and then maybe put in some wildflowers and some wild uh, seed sown seed in the in the spring to give you that little bit of extra color and and vision for your um for your for your, for your bees and perhaps for your for your butterflies too and i suppose another little project you can do if you've got children and you want to plant something that will feed the wildlife in the future is obviously plant your apple pips mm. now you're not going to get the nope <laughs> lovely discovery or whatever it is that you've been eating out of them but you will get a do they class them as crab apples or yeah but you, well it's uh, i think the, i think the description is a wilding as we a wilding, as we learned it, from, yeah. from from michael yes and they do fruit mm. potentially so yeah you, you're not going to get a, a true to flavor type apple but you will get something that you could then plant out and grow yeah, indeed. into a tree and potentially offset your carbon footprint as well. As well, yeah, perfect. And now we're inside a lot more this time of year because mm. obviously it's not quite so nice outside. No. House plants, obviously, well, historically have the last few years really taken off again, and mm. it's lovely to see the sort of plants people are now growing in their, their their houses again. What should we be thinking about with house plants this time of year? Yeah, so yeah, light levels are obviously dropping now. Um, I think it's all about the, the watering. Obviously, you're not going to be watering as much because they're not going to be growing uh, as much. So yeah, reduce the amount of watering, but that's not to say that they they're not going to need water. If you're growing things like uh, cyclamen, and you might buy your first azaleas, and you know as we're running up towards uh, the festive time. Time, they obviously quite demand quite a lot of water so yep. flowering plants yes treat a little bit different people for, for your foliage plants yeah try and over uh oh, try and avoid over watering it's the biggest killer of of house plants as we know um 75 percent of plants which are over watered unfortunately fail and die so on yep. that status itself we need to be a little bit more careful but it is so 
reassuring Peter. You know, I walk through our houseplant area and I'm, I'm seeing varieties of houseplants I've not seen for 20 or 30 years, which makes me feel old. But it's also so reassuring that, you know, everybody, everybody's got an appetite for more unusual foliage plants. And I was in one garden centre um, a few weeks ago when I saw the most expensive uh, Swiss cheese plant, a variegated Swiss cheese plant, and it had a price tag of over £150. Wow. I, I, I stopped in my tracks because I just thought that just shows you the power of social media, of Instagram, because obviously people love sharing their houseplants uh, and their passion of growing them. And if that's an example of you know what, what uh, social media can do, uh, can bring out the sort of the best and uh, of our interest in a plant and obviously push the price up, then that's good. But Chinese money plants, of course, were demanding quite high prices. I know we struggled here for a, a few months getting hold of them, but they've sort of settled down now. So uh, yep. a little bit like our gas prices at the moment, um, you know, there's variability in plants, but if you're building your collection up and you're wanting to keep them growing well, then yes, mist spray your foliage plants, increase the humidity, uh, maybe give them a little bit of a feed, but not as often as you, you have been doing through the summer. And above all, just enjoy your, your plants and really connect with what they're doing. Not probably the best time to be propagating, but sometimes opportunities do arise. You know, a bit of a, a stem gets broken, then yeah, pop it into some nice gritty compost. And if you're thinking about then maybe getting some things into flower for Christmas, then there are a few possibilities out there too. Okay, so it's not too late for me to repot my orchid then, because I've got an orchid that's grown a bit sideways and okay. um, <laughs> need, it would benefit. I know. Thinking back to the podcast we did with Manos mm. earlier in the year. Yes. It was a very interesting podcast on orchids if you haven't listened to it. He was suggesting sort of August, um, September time to repot your orchids. So mm. I'll, I think you know, from memory it was give the plant a really good soaking so the roots are nice and sort of pliable and then get some growth technology orchid bark that they sell and just repot it and hopefully get it standing back upright again yes yeah i was gonna say peter yeah so when you take the plant out you'll probably find some of the roots have died have gone really brown yep. um, so go along and, and trim those back as well i think that's okay. quite important and then yeah reposition in the in the uh, the orchid compost bark the the plant so it's it's is it right so you can play around with it because it's got a, a quite a uh statutory sort of root system with a bit of a um, bit of prodding and poking you can get it nice and upright and make sure it's just slightly slightly proud of the uh, of the, the top of the bark as well so you're okay. not so you're not burying those bottom leaves that's quite important if i remember right. manners correctly and then yeah they give it a bit of a water put it back in the same position and hopefully it'll start to give you some some new nice growth yes okay because just thinking with orchids do i need to particularly go for a and it it hasn't it's grown a couple of leaves mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. it started growing sideways okay. um and it's i wouldn't say particularly root bound i mean no. so it's got a nice clear pot that mm. it grows in yeah so can i just literally take it out mm -hmm. cut off the old leaves put some new bark in there and yes. repot it in the same pot it's not one of these plants that needs always to be no. upsized every time definitely not no you're, you're quite right in, in saying that peter i think you've just got to get that as so long as the proportion of the leaves to the pot is right so yeah it looks it, look, more it doesn't look crazy yeah, it just yeah. obviously looks a bit sideways yeah. and keeps on tipping yeah. itself over so by just literally taking it out and just repositioning the roots within the bark that might yeah. be enough to get it nicely upright again and yes if there's any yellowing leaves yeah only remove leaves which are either damaged or yellow leave try and leave as many leaves in place as you can and that should then help yeah, no, the, the, the leaves are all like, nice and green good. and healthy it was mm. just the yeah. fact that it's yeah. sort of grown sideways that it's Indeed. making me want to repot it. Indeed. And then obviously, um, as soon as you start to see a flowering spike, I think the other uh, advice Manus gave us was to put in a, a cane nice and early as the as the flower spike starts to develop. Yep. So then you can then quite easily uh, clip it into place so it grows nice and straight. Yeah, because mine, mine tend to grow nicely <laughs> sideways <laughs> as well. <laughs> but, but then I do, uh, to be fair, I leave my canes in all year round. I don't bother taking them no, in and out. There you go. And I just get an elastic <laughs> band and tie that around the cane and yeah. start pulling the, uh, the the shoots up so they they do end up flowering I, with I a think nice vertical you, Peter spike. you're pacing the picture of many people's orchids right around the country now because that's what we do with them isn't it they they sit there they become part of the family and you you know you do what you need to do with them but yeah. it's such a great plant and such a so, yeah I, they're the one of my most successful plants Chris there you go <laughs> Let's grow more orchids. <laughs> I do do well with my orchids. They're nice and easy. I love them. 
And just another job, sort of thinking of things to do this time of the year, Chris. My parents' house has got these lovely York flagstones mm. on the sort of driveway up to the house. However, this time of the year with the morning mists and the moisture in the air, they can get really slippy. And we found a fantastic product to get rid of all of that slippiness. It's called Algon. Okay. And really simple one to use, just wash it on with a watering can and off you go kills off the algae and i think i'm right in saying it's a natural herbicide so it's not horrific to the environment it's good for pets and safe yeah. for pets and yeah, yeah. it's safe for the pets and things like that and it's probably also a good time of year to be thinking about getting rid of the moss in the block paving and mm, around the edge of your uh, house and places like that. What what would you use for that? Yeah, so you could, uh, I mean, you, obviously you could get your power washer out and yep. uh, get out there and do that. And I tend to use that on my, on my decking area where I've got a bit of moss potential problems there. Or I've said there are other other products on the market. Um, uh, yeah, so Viva Green Moss Off would be a good one to perhaps uh, apply. Okay, because yeah, I know. So when I'm um, weed killing, mm. um, it always amazes me that glyphosate doesn't touch moss. It's no, like, uh, everything else seems to die, but moss. Yeah, and yeah. It's, gl- obviously, yeah. Got, you need a specific type mm. of herbicide to get rid of um, the moss. Don't yeah, you? I mean, glyphosate really goes for very broadleaf weeds, so it has to have a bit of structure for the for the chemicals, the herbicide to work effectively. Hence, the moss killers just just generally work on contact, don't they? So they basically. Okay. Do it that way, and very effective they are too. So it's, um, I think a little tip on on using certainly the um, uh, the moss off is to make sure that the air is quite dry before you apply it. Okay. So wait a few days if we've had some rain, you, you know, an opportunity, a bit of bit of sunshine, a bit of breeze to dry it, then apply the uh, the product. Works so much better than applying it on wet wet ground wet moss because yeah. moss is often no, it's, mm. it's got a great water retention that's capacity, the problem hasn't it yeah yeah it, yeah it does yeah, yeah that's it and the other uh, the other other option is obviously the wire brush indeed I mean, that's the, yeah, the stiff brush and yeah use that as a as a way of of clearing it too so it, sometimes it's a sort of three-pronged attack isn't it you might get the power washer for certain areas yep. chemicals might be have to be used which are obviously safe to the environment especially the organic versions and then maybe some hard back <laughs> slugging work on the on the brush side but uh, i think the most important thing is make your garden safe there's nothing worse than having any sort of slip hazards in in, in your garden especially if you you're using it an awful lot at this time of the year so we do have some work still to do in the garden then chris it's not just about sitting around drinking tea and biscuits now is it S- certainly not it's a bit of bit of uh, bit of hard work but hey it's the right time of the year to be doing it and the, the the wonderful preparations we do now will pay us back nicely come the spring brilliant okay so I'm looking forward to our next podcast, Chris. Um, my front garden, which hasn't been tarmacked over, is still mm-hmm. um, gravel. There used to be a bamboo okay. in it, which just grew and grew and grew, as, they do. as bamboos <laughs> do. And it got so big that I thought, no, you've got too big. We're getting rid of you. So I've dug it out and killed it off now. And um, I've got a, well, the front garden's, I don't know, 10 foot by 10 foot. It's mm-hmm. not a huge area, but... Our next show, hopefully, give me some ideas about what to put in that space, isn't it? Is yes. Yeah, so, we're, Peter, we're going to be looking at um, really good small tree suggestions for smaller gardens. So the whole gamut from a few evergreens to some lovely ornamental trees, lots of blossom trees, and everything in between. I'm really looking forward to to the next podcast. Fantastic. So hopefully I'll be able to put a proposal to my lovely wife as to what we can grow in our front garden in the near future. Absolutely. So that brings us to the end of our show. Thank you for all your suggestions as to what jobs I need to be getting on with, Chris. I know it's going to be a busy month, isn't it, Peter? Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Pleasure. Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more 
at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.